today really wanted to go a little bit different. You know, we've kind of gone beyond what we call the plumbing phase and, and kind of the foundational phases. How do we start to put our cloud on autopilot? What does this team that you've built that's become very experienced, very technologically advanced, do with these tools once you kind of finish the plumbing phase? And that's what we're going to focus today. The term cloud, I always feel like we have to, you know, validate it and, and say what we mean by it before we get started. And at Ahead, we've sort of taken an approach, what we call the meaningful cloud, which we talk about with our customers. And, and we say that because when we use the term cloud, we don't necessarily mean we're talking about AWS or Azure specifically. We're talking about a cloud that is yours, that is personal and meaningful for your, for your business. It starts really with enterprise service management. You know, we have to you know, make the assumption that we're going to change what we do in that space. We're going to change the way we do change control. We're going to challenge a lot of our ideas there. We have to have a high degree of automation and orchestration. We, we talk about this all the time, but it's, it's fundamental. And then when we look at public cloud and data center infrastructure, they really become part of your cloud. You know, we think of the public cloud, if you go to AWS or Azure and you consume just a simple service like AWS EC2, you know, from your point of view, you got a cloud service from Amazon. If you just took an EC2 service provided as a Windows or Linux server to your users, as it is from Amazon, it's not going to be what they need. You have to add on your business logic and your pieces. It doesn't patch itself, for example. You have to do all those things before you can present it to your, to your user. Same with showback, chargeback, business requirements. Certainly last but not least, you know, business requirements are everything. And we, you know, I talked with Eric Engel you know, a lot you know, recently when they were exiting their phase. And one of the things he said to me was the first service they created after you know, Windows, Linux, SQL, et cetera, uh, was a service to request more services. So that way they could you know, listen to the business, they have an intake process for their sprints, and literally users can go in there and say, hey, I want this service now, you know, because you gave me a Windows server, you gave me Apache, whatever it is, but I want this on top of it. And I think that's key. Ultimately, you know, it's this point, it's your business, it's your cloud. When you build this, it has to be meaningful for you, and you, know, you can come up with all, all sorts of names for it. The second thing that we always like to talk about here is that no two clouds are the same. You, know, you saw some of the examples that Eric Kaplan gave this morning of all the different technologies and stacks that we've deployed now. We've had Cisco, we've had VMware, we've had ServiceNow, we've had many, many pieces. And if you look at, you know, this is just some examples in the, in the circles you can see here. We see them change as well. You know, we see all sorts of variations on, on the term cloud. And you know, qu quite honestly, anybody that tells you they can just give you a cloud in a box in 30 days, it's just not realistic. It's a, it's a product, but it's not going to be meaningful for your business at that point. If we look at the journey, and this is the slide we really came up with last year, and kind of how we were sort of talking about the journey and the phases. And you know, what we realized, again, is as people exit that plumbing phase, there's all sorts of different directions that they take, whether they you know, do more DevOps type work initially, you know, or whether they do more of the self-healing type data center stuff that we call cloud operations. But what was clear is that the plumbing phase you know, had, to, had to change. It couldn't be this sequence of events. Oh, I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do public cloud, then I'm going to automate. You know, we have to do a lot of things in parallel, you know, on-premises. We have to look at infrastructure. We have to look at how do we simplify that. You know, we th see things like Tintree, converged infrastructure, hyper-converged, et cetera, you know, Nutanix, you know, all these things out there that can help in this area, uh, base services, capacity management. Public cloud, one of the big things that we say in this space is at the very least, when you start to go down this journey, is enable public cloud and start to experiment with it. That is you know, absolutely key. Even if you're not going to turn it into production yet, start playing with things in Amazon, Azure, and start to get familiar. Uh, and then cloud management and automation has to be happening in parallel with these other activities so that when you're building your, your cloud for your business, you're looking at public and on-premises, so ultimately you will have a cloud that works in both locations without a lot of rework later on. Well, that brings me on to really, you know, what's next and where do I want to take it now that we're, we're sort of talking about exiting that journey phase. First of all, you know, we've, the end of the journey phase, you've got a lot of single machine blueprints. So I'm going to go into a bit around automating a complex infrastructure as a service deployment on premises and public cloud. We'll talk about the blurring lines between infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. And then I really want to go into more around self healing cloud safety measures. We've heard about reactive healing, self healing data center. What's kind of the, the new, new approach to that given all the APIs and things that we can connect to today? It starts really with just a recap of. How do we deploy a single machine blueprint? This process hasn't really changed. You, you fill out an order form for a SQL server, you click the go button, your orchestration tool goes and connects to all of our external systems. You know, generating server names, I still you know, joke, it's like 
We go to workshops and I feel like half the day is taken up by trying to get people to align on the server naming convention. For some reason, it's the, it's the hardest conversation to have. But uh, once we get through that, the rest is actually easy. And then we uh, clone a server, you know, hopefully faster than these slides take to complete. And then uh, we hand off to configuration management and we apply our, our configuration, so our SQL server, all of our modules, et cetera, at this point. And we rinse and repeat that for every single machine blueprint that we want to create. The one thing we don't have to do a lot of is re, you know, redo a lot of that orchestration. You know, once you've got Infobox workflows and you know, storage and backup workflows, et cetera, they don't really change that much. What starts to change is a lot of the configurations inside of the OS, the variations you're going to offer in your service catalog. And if we look at our head aviation bag application, this again, this, this application, which I'll demo for you in a moment, allows us to track our bag. You know, big thanks to you know, Dan Wittenberg, our lead puppet engineer. You know, took a, we built a real live application that we could demo across all the different ways of, of deployment. Um, and so if we look at this diagram, what you're looking at on the left-hand side uh, is, a, is a VM deployed, you know, CentOS, and then we have a whole you know, series of puppet modules that go into it there. On the right-hand side, again, we have an OS deployed, and we deploy in MySQL, and this is a multi-machine blueprint now. We can deploy this as a stack. What we do, though, is you know, there's, there's different thoughts on, on the best way to do multi-machine blueprints because you, know, you could deploy the SQL server first, you know, check it's all up and running, and then deploy the app server. Our approach you know, really is not to use so much the cloud management platform for that piece, but to use the tools like Puppet and Chef for that. And what I mean by that is we'll deploy both of the servers apply both of the configurations, we give them a deployment ID. So we know if this QA person is deploying this environment, it gets an ID, and Puppet Chef know that that app server and that SQL server belong together, and we can build those dependencies into the, into the Puppet Chef logic, et cetera. So if we can roll the, the demo, I want to show you what this kind of looks like in a cloud management platform so you can see it. So what we're looking at is a head aviation cloud. In, this is in VMware vRealize Automation. And if we go to our service catalog, what you'll see here, you know, we've, we've kind of got a number of demos here, but we're looking at head aviation apps, and we're going to deploy what we call our head CDP baggage application. If we go in here, what you'll see is, you know, this is on vSphere in this case, and we've got a MySQL server there on vSphere, and we've assigned a Puppet role to it. So it's very easy for us to assign different identities to the nodes because it's all taken care of in Puppet. Same for the web server. And then we allow the application team to have, in this case, up to five deployments. All these deployment IDs can be driven from the release automation tools as well. Uh, once we deploy it, and I've got, I'm just going to fast forward ahead here in the recording, um, and so what you'll see in the items list you know, is we've got a full deployment of the AHEAD baggage application, in this case, on-premises. This one's on vSphere. So we've got AHC Ops 483. That's the, the naming convention we're using there. And we have the same app. We can deploy it into AWS as well. In this case, you don't see the NSX security groups, et cetera. Um, but now what we'll take is, you know, if we grab that server name and we punch it into our web browser, we can show you this application that, um, that we've built here. Let's wait for that to come up. And there it is. You can, you know, it's a full app. You know, it's got a web front end. It's got a database on the back end. I can check in a bag. I'll pop it in here. Checked in for the flight. Now we get a baggage, tr you know, bag tracking number. We can go in, check the status on that bag. Still checked in at the ticket counter. And then we can manage the bag as well. You know, sadly, my bag's gone missing. Apparently, for a, according to Twitter, it's in South America now or something. But, uh, <laughs> um, but there you go. And then, so we built this real world application. You can see it. It's, you know, it's a two tier application. So don't get me wrong, it's not the most complex thing out there. But it, it really gives us a sense of how we can, we can take this and, uh, and do, uh, do deployment. Uh, so, if we take that same application, so you saw the model in infrastructure as a service, where on the right-hand side we had the database server and we deployed it. On the left-hand side we had the app server. Um, if we look at this example now, what if we wanted to get out of the business of dealing with SQL, for example? What if we don't want to deploy SQL servers anymore, but we still want to deploy our application servers? So on the right-hand side, what you can see that we've done is we've replaced the SQL server with a PaaS service from Azure or AWS. You know, in our demo, we actually do it on, on AWS RDS service. If you swing by the booth, you'll, you'll see it there. So now we can deploy the exact same application, but we're not dealing with the SQL data, the MySQL database anymore. We still put our SQL data, um, the SQL data is still there, but it's on the AWS RDS service. Taking that a step further, you can go even you know, all in with PaaS in some cases, right? You know, things like you know, Azure Web Service, you've also got AWS Elastic Beanstalk, right? Now, I don't know if too many people are familiar with these 
these technologies. But you know, AWS Elastic Beanstalk, what that allows you to do is take your, your Java or your Python, your IS application, uh, zip it up, you know, put it onto AWS, and it will actually deploy all the underlying infrastructure to support that application. You know, one of the questions that I thought of as soon as we heard that was, well, okay, who patches everything? Well, you know, we know Java updates and all the, the .NET updates and things that we deal with. Well, you know, in April, uh, Amazon actually released the, the feature where they'll actually apply the minor security updates automatically for you. You can just give it a, give it a maintenance window. And when you're ready to push your, your major updates, you can schedule those. Or in some cases, you could just redeploy the stack as well if you wanted to kind of bleed off your load balancer and, you know, move on to the new deployment. So, you can see there's the same application. There's now just multiple ways. And you've heard about containers as well, which brings a whole new element into it. There's just a lot of choice and a, and a lot of ways that we can actually go about this. And we haven't even talked about how we tie that into release automation and, and DevOps methodologies as well. But so that's deployment. What I want to get onto next is really about self-driving cloud. And when I was thinking about this, you know, and talking to some of my colleagues, it was really like, well, you know, people today, you know, we're thinking around Uber, you know, Tesla, Google, this concept of self-driving cars is coming around. This seemed like a great analogy to what we want to do, you know, in our data center today. And if we think even further, it's not so much our data center anymore, it's our self-driving cloud. You know, we can talk about a self-healing data center, but that seems like that's too basic now with, with all the APIs and all the things that we're looking, looking to connect together. And that's really where we you know, want to go next with this. So if we take our bag app again, in this case, we used AWS as the example. So it's not on-premises yet. We've deployed, you know, in, in AWS. And we've created what we call an auto-scaling uh, group here um, for the bag app. So what we can do is on the left, you can see we have US West 1. We have our, you know, we use an Amazon Cloud Formation template to deploy the app. On the right, we have US East 1. We can tell that RDS instance to replicate to US East 1. And what we can do then in re response to a fa failure is simply fail over, US East 1 becomes the primary region, and US West 2 becomes the, uh, you know, the new secondary region as well. If we look at now you know, safety, right? Now, two things come to mind when, when I look at this car, right? One, it's, it's extremely small. You know, I could definitely fit in it. Quite frankly, uh, Tim Carr, Jason Nash, and myself could go have a bloody good vacation in that car, but that's a, that's a, that's a side issue. But uh, um, second thing is, uh, Someone else told me these things keep crashing, right? Apparently, like all the tests, these things are actually go, go, going off road, and I don't know, I don't know exactly what's going on, but hopefully everyone's okay. But um, you know, seat belts, ABS, lane sensory, there's controls we put in place in our in our cars to protect us. What are the uh, the same kind of things that we we do in our data center and in, in our cloud now, right? It's change control, code promotion, things we talk about all the time, login, audit in, um, and one of the things you know we, we started to do a lot more of is. QA workflows in response to auto scale outs and events, right? So how do we check that this event happened? How do we validate everything's still running in, in response to that? And that's, I think that's growing, and we're seeing more and more of that. Certainly in our workshops, people are asking those questions as well, is, you know, how do I do more automated QA for every single piece of automation that I build? And that doesn't mean you necessarily have to do all of that up front, because you don't want your cloud project to be you know, multiple years, but it's another area that you can improve you know, over time while you're still showing value back through, through automation. The next thing, when you start to think about that and, and log in and audit in specifically, when we kind of work with ServiceNow, we have a bit of an R&D project going on with them right now, and you know, we've done some very, uh, very exciting things in the space, particularly around what we call our compliance framework with ServiceNow. And so what that allows us to do is when we build these blueprints, we have all the information. We know all the relationships, all the data, who owns it. Uh, you know, this server depends on this one. And we can feed all that information into ServiceNow or another CMDB tool if, you, if you're not using ServiceNow. And the other thing to think about at this point is so many CMDB projects have failed. You know, I've been part of organizations where I've seen the CMDB, they spin up a project, and then nobody fills, you know, nobody updates the information, or people go and they you know, have their own respective spreadsheets, et cetera. And, you know, and don't actually you know, take the time to keep ServiceNow up to date. And so what we can do is, with, if you do cloud and your CMDB project together, you can get extremely, extremely good results. And same with that business dependency mapping. That's the bottom box you see in the compliance framework. We, it, the workflow was actually surprisingly simple. It's a case of you just say, this is the parent object, this is the child. This is, you know, this is the parent child for each, each piece of your multi-machine blueprint. You feed all that information into ServiceNow, and then you can run discovery in there, and it builds that dependency map, which you know, from an executive level, people want to know, OK, when this piece goes down, you know, what app was affected? And I think that's extremely powerful, what we're, 
what we're doing in that space. And so if we uh, jump to a demo again here, we've got a demo showing the, the auto scaling group and, and what we do. And this is the same bag application, this time running in AWS instead of vSphere. And we've got four nodes currently, currently running on it right now. If we go over to our load testing system called Locust, you know, we use this to basically simulate users running against the, the bag application. So we can take, you know, 2,000 users, 250 users a second, start swarming. Love the name of this tool. But, uh, you know, starting to hatch, you know, a number of users there right now. And then what we'll see, you know, I'll, I'll fade over here and you'll see it. 2,000 users, we're starting to see failures, you know, for in, in the environment. If we now go back over to you know, Amazon EC2 and what we call CloudWatch, you know, there we're monitoring the number of requests on the Elastic Load Balancer in this case, but this could be, you know, AppDynamics as well and some other tools that you might have. But in this case, you know, just very basic on a, in a CloudWatch management tool, let's refresh this. And what you'll see is, you know, a huge spike, you know, in the number of requests. There's a bit of a delay, obviously, you know, between when, when AWS reports versus the, the load testing tool. Now, if we go back over to AWS and we do a refresh, we can already see that another node is, is initializing in response to that. So we haven't had to do anything. No one's had to take uh, any specific action, but we're already you know, adding additional, additional capacity there. And this, is, this might be an old story to some people, and, you know, but I think it's very valuable in you know, readdressing re it. You know, apps running, there's another version running in public cloud that we have there. Um, and if we refresh again, you'll actually see that we're, you know, we're spinning up another node as well in response to that. But going back to the safety of it, because I think that you know, that's still absolutely, absolutely key. One of the things we've done is we use an AWS Lambda function. Now, this is a different way to think about orchestration. We've got a function now running, not on any server, that responds to the AWS event and creates a change control and service now. First thing we do, we say automated change in capital letters because we want to know what's, what's human changes that are happening and what are actually just automated changes in response to the system. Uh, and I think that's key as you start to think of your automation and the service accounts and things that you use for it, you always want to know, is this happening from, a, from, from an orchestration engine? Is this from you know, CloudWatch and a, and a Lambda function? You know, or is this something somebody's actually done? And ideally, add all the information you know, to that as well so you know what actions to take and, what, and what's, actually, what's actually happened. Just to kind of you know, recap before we move off kind of auto scaling, you know, the other areas of automation that we talk about you know, are things like auto expanding disks at two o'clock in the morning in, re in response to events, scheduled workflows that you can run as well. So that way you know, you're automatically adding storage on demand, you know, offering backup on demand to users. There's all sorts of things that you can do. You know, snapshots on demand are a common one where IT teams are like, okay, you know, I, I wanna give snapshot functionality to the business. The problem is they won't give the snapshot up when, I, you know, when, when it's due. So you can build a workflow offer this out, you know, release it as an operations workflow. If somebody snapshots the VM, they get an email saying it's gonna be automatically deleted in three days. Three days later, they get an email, it gets automatically deleted. It tells them the policy every time. If they want it longer, they should have taken a backup and you offer backup as a service as well. And obviously with Rubrik and others, there's, there's some exciting things you can, you can do in that space. And that's really kind of just a glimpse of what we're we're doing in the, in the self-healing, self-driving space, you know, whether it's auto-scaling, you know, reactive healing, or scheduled tasks. I think it's, uh, it's pretty exciting. But I really also wanted to talk today about you know, the people that kind of create why we call this, this cloud experience. We get, we get asked this a lot in the workshops. What's the right skill set? And you know, we go to user groups all the time, and I see people stand up and do keynotes, and they say, your job's changing, you need to learn programming. And it's really, and it's a very basic statement. It's not, it's not really enough you know, in, the, in the cloud world. And, and so I thought about this a lot as we're talking to a number of customers who are kind of saying, well, how do I structure a team? What, you know, what's the right mix? And you know, just what we've learned over the last couple of years from, from people like Eric Engel and others. Um, and so we took a look at the characteristics of the most successful you know, cloud deployments and, and some of the things we've, we've thought about in the space. And certainly leverage existing skill sets you know, goes without saying, you know, we want to leverage the subject matter experts in VMware, storage, networking, your app teams, your security teams, right? We don't want to build a new cloud team that simply takes over everyone else's job. We want it to be highly, highly collaborative. You do need to do, learn some programming. That isn't going to go away. But it's not, the, it's not the ultimate thing. You can have the best programmer, but they may not create the best experience, which I'll, which I'll hit on more in a second. And the same when I went out to Knowledge 16 recently in Vegas, and one of the things that dawned on me from Knowledge 16 was there was no one really there from the VMware community. And the same at, at VMworld when we were there, 
you know, last few years, I thought, well, a lot of the ServiceNow people that I know today, certainly from working at Ahead and, and just in the way our teams are structured, um, you know, it's just, you know, no, they weren't, they weren't at, at VMworld. And so it was really interesting because, you know, it showed me that the, these are, an, this is an area where we see coming together and yet the conferences couldn't be further apart from those people being aligned. Then we took a little bit further, right, you know, in, in terms of creating the cloud experience. And I thought back to, you know, you know how I got into this and, and what excited me. And, you know, I look back at, you know, what I, when I studied computer science, you know, many years ago, and, we, and you know, I did a lot of programming too, but one of the modules that stood out for me, which I didn't appreciate at the time, uh, was human-computer interaction. Um, and there was a specific book in that, you know, a re required book that you had to read, which was The Design of Everyday Things. And you know, I didn't read it just because of a teapot, by the way. But, uh, you know, it's a... Uh, <laughs> Um, but this is an amazing book, you know, because um, at first I thought, what is this thing, right? It talked about door handles on a glass door and how somebody interacted. If the, if the door handles moved a little to the right, then they would push it instead of pulling it. Like, it was all this subliminal, subliminal piece. But then at the end of the module, they brought it all back together in terms of how you create user experiences, you know, on a form and how users are going to interact, you know, with IT from that, from that perspective. And ultimately, that door to me is maybe one of the missing, missing things as well, is if, you, if you've got the best programmer, but they can't talk to the end business user and translate what they need, and not just translate into what they need, but into an experience where you're guiding them through the form. Um, if you haven't met Dave Janis here from ahead, you know, him and I talk a lot about influencing behaviors all the time. How do, we, how do we not have to tell someone what to do something, but create the forms and create the controls, specifically around capacity management chargeback? Like, how do I give people a bucket of resources? Or if I show them a dollar sign on the menu, are they just going to ignore it? Are they going to acknowledge it? You know, we, we talk a lot about this because we don't want anything to ever feel forced. You know, our goal is always, how do we break down this barrier between IT and the business? You know, we talk about IT empowering the business, but that can only happen you know, if we create an experience that people truly love and, and enjoy. And ultimately, you know, this is what we want, right? Hashtag cloud life, you know, I'm enjoying the cloud. Everybody's talking about your awesome cloud. What we don't want is a cloud where it's a complete train wreck. You know, you haven't invested, you haven't marketed, nobody comes, nobody uses it. They go and build their server, it doesn't work. You know, the orchestration, right? that's, that's what we don't want. We want this, this real, you know, real cloud experience. And so when you think of the positions, you know, I've had, a, I've had a tough time kind of labeling this, you know, and, you know, we definitely, you know, if people want to email in and tell us what they think the best name for these engineers are, you know, there's, he has a handful of them. You know, first three, data center engineer, cloud engineer, full stack engineer is another common one going around. So my colleagues have been writing some blog posts on that one specifically. You know, and it's interesting because full stack engineer, people, some people talk about it as this is a, more of a converged stack type thing. Other people talk about it as, okay, I have to know all the way up the development stack. Um, cloud engineer and data center engineer, it depends who you talk to, you know, what those mean. And, you know, there's business process engineers we sometimes see in cloud projects. You know, I'll make a joke, cloud experience engineer, cloud infrastructure engineer, cloud services engineer. Is it your cloud pilot? I don't know. You know, think of, a, think of something new. We definitely want to, you know, come up with a new term for this because I, I think just cloud engineer and full stack engineer don't necessarily capture the, the entire experience of what, what you're trying to, trying to create here. Bringing this all back, you know, we've, we've heard from a ton of, ton of people today already. And ultimately, how do we, you know, when we look at the cloud, you look at the AWS grid of services, and you look at the Azure grid of services, it's good to start thinking about creating your own cloud, you know, cloud service grid, if you will. You know, if we look at this, and you, as you start to onboard these things, you know, you see all these PaaS services, you see everything Jeff had to say from Amazon. Um, you know, we've got Azure services, we've got on-premises services, you know. Start to kind of take those services, wrap your business logic around them, and then present them in your cloud. And there's, there's an art to really onboard in those services. You know, and that's where, you know, going back to that experimentation, you know, while, you look, while you're sort of you know, doing your main cloud project, certainly be, have this Amazon, this Azure playground, you know, same on the vSphere side, put, you know, put virtual appliances in, et cetera, to play with technologies you want. But play with them and get used to them and then decide, okay, does this, this service from Amazon meet one, all of our regulatory requirements? If I'm going to offer this to my end users, you know, what's the impact? You know, should they do it? Is it going to cost more than on-premises? Does it matter if it costs more? They get in a better experience. And I think that ultimately should be the driving factor because then you can just present your cloud to the business and, and they're obviously going to, going to appreciate it. The journey continues you know, all the time. Going back to the plumbing phase, when you exit, you, know, you could go down multiple tracks. So you could do them all at the same time. But what we definitely, again, always find, just to reiterate, is at the end of that plumbing phase, you have people extremely talented in orchestration, in configuration management, in coding, in, and hopefully in human-computer interaction and these pieces as well. And you might have people that work with your development team to start build, helping them with their release automation and DevOps. 
you might start to build more services around cloud operations, that snapshotting capability, backing up. You know, actually, Adam Cavalier from Tintree and I work quite closely on something around syncing data, for example. You know, how do I give a QA team you know, a brand new you know, brand new set of data at the click of a button, and we use APIs at the storage level to accomplish this. So there's, there's a lot of things you can just do in your environment you know, that, that can really benefit, uh, as well as adding on, again, the public cloud services. And don't forget about infrastructure as a service. You know, at the beginning of this presentation, I talked about infrastructure as a service and all those modules. They provide a lot of flexibility, and some people want that flexibility. So having those options continuing to invest there is key while you experiment in these, in these other areas. And with that said, how I want to really end off, you know, four years ago, I had a, a Mars rover kind of a, you know, slide I used to throw around, you know, if, you know, if anyone's, anytime somebody said they couldn't do something, I'd just put up the Mars rover and be like, really? Like, you can't automate backups? She has a, has a rover on Mars, right? And then uh, today, we sort of, someone told me, <laughs> that's kind of old, but um, I looked up a new one, and you know, SpaceX today, you know, uh, Landing rockets vertically on a on a pad out in the in the ocean. So uh, you know, anytime you know, sometimes we you know, even at server naming. Going back to that, it amazes me sometimes getting into workshops and you know, server naming is the is the most difficult thing that we're going to have to you know get over here. And so you know, I just suggest you know, challenge everything. Look, you know, keep the eyes on the prize and, and focus on that. And we always welcome you to you know, our head lab and briefing center. Our guys are at the booth showing that app in all three of those deployment models. You know, we're happy to share it with you as well and give you guys access. You can see how we coded it, all the pieces we have. And uh, I think you'll find it very exciting.